thank you so much for those of you who stayed. Um, I've seen this film, well, it's been a while since I've seen it, and um, watching it on a bigger screen was really nice. Um, I watched it um, last night on Amazon, that they have that one where there's more English in it. So um, I was glad to see that you were able to get this copy that has um, more Spanish in it. And um, what I wanted to say, um, you know, every time I watch this film, I find something new. Um, I was paying attention to the context that this happens during Christmas, and the character's name is Jesus, and you have Angel de la Guardia, which is guardian angel, which he really becomes the angel of death, he becomes the dark angel. So I find it very ironic that we have this Christmas space, and instead of having celebrating the birth of baby Jesus, we are seeing the birth of a vampire in Jesus. Jesus Gris, Jesus Gray, and I was thinking if that was an homage to um, Dreyer's film Vampire, where the character there is Alan Gray. I wasn't sure if the Gris was referring to his skin color and the way it changes, so I thought it was really interesting how Del Toro has all these layers of meaning, so when you're watching it, you're like, oh, that's, that's really interesting what he's doing, and I'm not sure if like I said, his last name Gray has to do with that homage to vamp that vampire film, which was one of, I think, one of the best vampire films from the 1930s. After Nosferatu, then you have Dreyer's vampire based on Bram Stoker's um, Dracula. Um, so I thought that that was very interesting to look at um, how Angel de la Guardia is the angel of death, and then at the very end when they're both fighting, you have the angel of death over Jesus, right? So this whole Catholicism that's weaved in throughout the film is very um, interesting to analyze. Um, I also love the art angels, right? The angels that are that appear, and we have like two contrasting spaces. Um, um, Jesus Gris owns a store, and he, he seems to have this romantic affiliation with these old items that he takes care of and, and sells. And then on the other hand, you have De La Guardia, the businessman, the cold-hearted businessman who's sickly, he's about to die, and the, the cruelty that he manifests towards his um, nephew, who's a bit of a goon, but still, the cruelty, the beating. So you see him, so this industrial man, a type of um, vampiric figure, right? Not a, a vampire himself, but the cruelty um, and sort of the idea that he's a capitalist and a capitalist is being uh, vampiric figures. I mean, that's been dealt with before. So you have these two spaces. And in one space, in the Grises shop, you have the archangel, which he takes care of, it seems, with, um, with, um, with attention. Whereas in the um, industrial building, you have all the angels hanging as if as if dead, right? So they're just covered in plastic, hanging, which reminds the image of the hanging man upside down when he's bleeding, um, you know, for the blood. So I see these two contrasting figures, and um, Jesus Gris is the one who receives the gift, right, of this this beetle that that can give life, right, but also turns you into a monster. And what I found really interesting, whereas the businessman wants to do this to continue with whatever nefarious acts he does in the material world, Gris, unlike most vampires, decides to end his life. He ends his life by killing or destroying the scarab, the beetle, and therefore assassinating himself. And we don't see too many um, vampire suicides. We do some, but usually the vampire will do everything to continue with life, right? Sacrifice its victims. And then we see that moment where he's with Aurora, his granddaughter, um, and there's a moment there that he seems like he's going to attack her, but he does not. You know, that's where he recovers his, his humanity and then does that uh, moment where he destroys the scarab and destroys himself. Um, so I think those, those are some of the, the comments um, I wanted to, to make, and I was wondering if you had any questions or comments, or did you find anything um, interesting? I think one of the questions I pose is, how is this film a vampire film, and how is it not? Because I had one student was like, is this a vampire film? Like, so what, why would we think it's not, and why would we think it is?
I was just going to ask that question. Any of you had comments or questions? No, uh, well, one thing that uh, interests me about this, and Del Toro does it in uh, Ant Labyrinth as well, is the, the role of the child. Because, you know, uh, good horror is, you know, frequently a metaphor for the behaviors of humans. And you have to wonder uh, are these sort of fantastic things that are happening in reality, or are they the perception of an imaginative child seeing the misbehaviors of humans. I mean, specifically the role of the scarab, which you know, looks an awful lot sometimes like a heroin needle, especially when uh, the grandfather is sort of lying down on the stairs and she catches him. You know, uh, and I think that's a very interesting. It adds a, a layer to the metaphor that I, I think that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that as a drug addiction. So that, that's great. Thank you. This might be a little bit too much for memory-wise, but last night we, we watched uh, the movie Let the Right One In, oh, yeah. Swedish. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked a little bit about the linguistics of translation and how in the American version it becomes Let Me In and how that drastically alters kind of how we look at this. I was curious, did you find, and you mentioned seeing it on Amazon and it was total English, did you find any linguistical kind of um, moments was, like that? Um, it was mostly English, they still kept some of Spanish, but like for the voiceover in the beginning, it was English, and it was pretty much the, the same, the same thing. Although, you, you bring up that point, I did want to also uh, remark on how this is sort of the beginning of like the globalized map. Well, I guess the map has always been global, but I thought this was global in terms of you have Ron Perlman speaking English, you have Claudio Brooks speaking English, and then you have um, uh, Greece speaking with Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman is speaking in English and he's answering in Spanish. So I think this was a really important film in the 90s where it's sort of remarking on cinema being more global. So we're not, we can't really speak. This is a, a Mexican, well, it's a co production by a Mexican director, but we see how it's becoming more global. And the characters, you have Margarita, they're in Mexico, but they're playing Argentinian music. So if you're not familiar with the landscape in Mexico, you might think you're in Argentina. And then uh, um, the actor is a famous um, actor from Argentina, and you have a Mexican actress, and you have a, a an actor from the United States, sort of all in the same place, and I think the film becomes confusing. If you're not familiar with the geography or the culture, you might think you're in Argentina, but we're really in Mexico City, right? So, um, so I remember the first time I saw it, I thought it happened in Argentina. I had to watch it again. Like, oh no, no, it's Mexico. But, but, but all these, all these um, um, images and sounds can, uh, kind of confuse the space. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, how uh, the Doro does that, and he's sort of gesturing towards a much more global um, film market. So I did want to uh, mention that, um, that his use of English. And then, as we know, Del Toro then moves to Hollywood, and his, his, his production is now much more international. Um, and he will use the uh, Spanish speaking, speaking actors in his, in his films and his TV series, like in The Strain. Yeah. Any other? I'm just really happy you brought up um, play two at the beginning and this idea of Mr. Boy, the projecting tongue that um, right. brings us back to, to sort of folklore, pre-humanistic um, vampires. I, I think he's playing with that here as well, with the scarab. Um, yeah. The question, it, it sort of makes you question what, how, who are or what are all of the vampiric figures? Yeah. Because the scarab itself is a bit of a vampire. Right, it is, because it is, it is sucking the blood, but also converting his victims into vampires. So in that sense, it's vampire. Also the fact that it's blood. You need the blood to nourish. So that's vampiric. And also, there's a Twilight Zone episode. Do you, I don't know if you've ever watched a Twilight Zone. There is one with the beetle that is also this vampiric creature where this woman has eternal life. I don't think she sucks the blood, but there is this beetle. So I thought that was a really, I, I wonder if that sort of inspired 
his monster. I also thought it was really interesting how his soup's grease, his body changes. Not only is he pale, but he has all these crevices and folds that remind you of the beetles. So he's becoming a vampire, but his body seems to be turning into an insect, which is not uncommon for him in those films, you know, where if you think of the shape of water, the shape of water. And um, even Pan's Labyrinth, the, the monster in Pan's Labyrinth, it's very white. So I think, you know, we could see the sort of continuation of themes from Kronos up to The Shape of Water. And, and he's producing in direct after, so I'm going to see that next week. So he has a new monster, so I'm very curious how this new monster is going to be. If in Blade 2 you have Mr. Boy, the projectile tongue that sucks, what is he going to do with this new monster? So that's what's really interesting. Maybe for the question, but why is his uh, suit on backwards? Oh, I think I think what if, if the morgue. I yeah. think they zip his suit on. So probably when he walked out of the rush, it was probably easier to zip his suit in the front. That's kind of what I. Uh, yeah, that's kind of. And then the, I was reading something before uh, coming here, and they talk about the little. Oftentimes, has more scenes in his films, and I have to go back and look at that. I don't remember that being the case. But the morgue scene was really funny and gross, you know, like many of his films. And I also thought the little girl was interesting too because she just says one word in the film. I don't think I noticed that before, that she just says grandfather. And that reminded me also of The Shape of Water, right? Where you have a woman who doesn't speak. So I'm wondering if, how, how that, I haven't, I just started thinking about this today. So I think that would be really interesting. Um, to study the Toro and women who do not speak. Like, what, what does that mean, right? Yeah, so any other comments or questions? It's really nice that you came out to see this film. I think it's, it's, it's a, a great film for, for, for Mexico. It was a great film for the Toro because that you know, propelled him to a pretty good career. Yeah, yes. Uh, I was trying to make comments about uh, the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Is, uh, I'm a big fan of like Twilight Zone and Bob Sterling. And um, he also made a show called Night Gallery. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and actually there's DVDs where there's the idea of adults for the commentary for it. And that was actually a really huge inspiration for him. Uh, the like, Twilight Zone uh, or the uh, episode? The Night Gallery, but also just like I think in general he was a big fan of Bob Sterling. So it would make sense that that's scary there. Yeah. Oh, that, thank you very much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I love this one. I grew up watching this one. I love it, but not the other. What was the other one? Uh, it's called Night Gallery. Night Gallery. Yeah, I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen that one, but I'm going to because I love all things horror. And all things horror in the Latin American context because for a long time, especially when I was starting to do my research and I published my book, The Gothic Imagination, everyone said, oh, vampires have nothing to do with Latin America. So my whole research has been, oh no, we've been writing vampire stories since the 1800s. And in fact, the first Batman are from the Americas. So there was a group of uh, indigenous group in the Mayan um, community that they called themselves the Bat People. And the Bat was a deity, it was a sacred being that took the souls to the afterlife. So the Bat, um, as a deity, as a god, that was pre-Columbian. And it was after the conquest that the vampire, the bat, which was not called a vampire, it was then, you know, the scientists called it a vampire bat. So they made this bat a monster. And then that's the monster that informs uh, Bram Stoker's work, right, that we see a vampire bat in Bram Stoker's work. So it's really interesting how this bat figure that was a god was then transformed into a monster. And then we see this monster representation in, in Mexican films. And we see the, uh, one of the first Mexican films from 1957. It's called El Vampiro. You can find it on YouTube. It's fantastic. Um, and the, what's really interesting about that Mexican film is that the woman is the vampire film. In fact, it is, from what I can see, it's the first female vampire film in cinema. So we don't usually have the, you know, the Van Helsings of the world that come in and kill, kill the vampire and reestablish order. But here you have a woman, a woman who is representative of the Virgin Guadalupe, who is the protector of the home. She comes and casts out the vampire. <coughs> so I, I really like that this little girl here also is the one who beats the, um, the, 
the happens, the other vampire, the, the other one who was stealing, but in a different way. So, well, why don't we leave it here? But thank you very much, and have a good rest of the Saturday. And I'll be around.